So when money from recorded music first started to decline, many looked to the live music space as the safest bet for music industry revenue. Then came an economic downturn, which put even more pressure on a market that may already have been saddled with some inflated expectations. But with even more bands on the road and more competition for audience dollars, buying a ticket has gone from being a relatively straightforward um, process to being a complex and even controversial exchange these days. So artists are getting into the game directly with some venue buyouts and fan ticketing schemes. Venues are trying all kinds of experiments like mobile ticketing apps and various tie-ins. Uh, high surcharges are leading some promoters to look at options, um, options different from Live Nation and Ticketmaster. And the secondary ticketing market is also getting a lot of attention and not all of it positive. So this panel will look at what's going on today in today's ticketing marketplace and maybe even give a sense of where it's all headed. So let's welcome our panelists and our moderator, Greg Cott of the Chicago Tribune. Good morning. Thanks for coming. I am Greg Cott. Thanks for the intro. Um, and uh, I'm glad to be here at uh, Future Music, uh, the, the uh, annual summit. As a journalist covering this thing for the last decade plus uh, since, the, since its inception, uh, I'm pleased to uh, let you guys know that this is one of the best conferences you can possibly attend in terms of, you know, looking what, what's coming up in terms of being ahead of the curve in terms of the music technology government policy sector. Uh, hopefully this panel will be up to those standards. We're looking at pro pro probably the uh, single biggest uh, issue uh, in terms of a revenue pool for the music industry in the next five to ten years. Um, so that's significant. A lot of people are looking at live music as the savior of the music industry because, you know, obviously people are still paying for that uh, experience that cannot be digitized, right? Go to a live show, can't possibly reproduce that on YouTube uh, in the same way that you can actually be in that room with that artist. So we're going to look at this uh, phenomenon from uh, the viewpoints of some of these experts up here, and I do think they are some of the most significant voices in the uh, ticketing industry, in the live concert industry. Uh, we have Andrew uh, Dreskin, who is the CEO and co-founder of Ticketfly a ticketing agency that has uh, sprung up in the last few years. We've got uh, Seth Hurwitz, who probably doesn't need any introduction at all, but uh, is, a, uh, is a legend in the live music industry with his uh, work at the uh, club and arena level and um, just booking bands for, for decades now. Uh, Peter Jenner, manager, um, just what, uh, talk about legendary figures. Pink Floyd has never been the same since uh, he cut them loose uh, decades ago. That's right. Andrew Kaplan, talent buyer at Jam Productions. Again, another one of the, uh, the independent promoters that is uh, fighting, uh, you know, in, in, a, in an environment where there's a, been a, an awful lot of consolidation in the live music industry. Jam Productions out of Chicago, still uh, going strong for uh, several decades now. Uh, we got Mike Luba, who is the uh, president of Global Music S2. S2BN Entertainment. Mike has uh, been at the forefront of a number of innovations uh, in the uh, live music industry <clears throat> with Live Nation a few years ago, and then prior to that with Madison House, uh, true innovators in this field. And then we have John Potter, who is the president of the Fan Freedom Project. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for being here. And uh, I'll get this going by talking about this whole notion of uh, the industry as a revenue stream for artists. Um, in the first half of 2011, uh, there has been a, uh, an increase in revenue in the touring industry, which is a rare thing for, for the music industry these days. Uh, Polestar is reporting that uh, a very, very healthy first half of 2011. Here's a caveat. Fewer, um, more revenue, 
uh, over 2010 and the first half of 2011, but uh, actually fewer tickets sold. And uh, to open it up, uh, Seth, I'd like you to address that, that uh, little notion. Where, what is the actual health of the live touring industry right now. If you read those Polestar reports, people are saying, you know, it's, it's doing better than ever. What's well, your perspective? last year when it was supposedly doing horrible, it, it, was, it was fine. Uh, you know, I got a lot of calls from uh, newspapers. And, so your business sucks right now, right? And it's like, well, my business doesn't suck. Well, the music business sucks. It's like, well, depends on what you call the music business. I mean, I suppose if you talked about the airline business, You'd have to talk about United Airlines and all these people that are losing a lot of money, but you, you know Southwest and JetBlue and people like that are doing just fine. So they would ask me, you know, well, but the music industry is in trouble, right? Well, no, my music business is not in trouble. I mean, theirs, and I suppose you could say they are the music industry. Their model doesn't work, but music business is fine. Um, now I was in denial last year, but. Uh, <laughs> Um, no, it really was. It was. So this year, they call back and, you know, so what are you doing different this year? I'm like, well, I'm not doing anything different because last year worked. What do you mean? It was in the toilet. I said, well, I told you last year. It, you know, business is fine. People are going to my shows. I mean, if you do a show in the right building for the right ticket price and it's a nice venue and you treat people right, you're fine. There's not a lot of examples of shows. I mean, in all the articles you read, right, if you think about it, Nobody said, well, you know, Arcade Fire is at a 10,000-seat theater and the tickets are only $35 and there's a problem. No, they sold out. But if you talked about, you know, um, oh, I don't know if I want to name any names here, but <clears throat> I can't think of any. That's all. I'd be happy to name them if it came to mind. But um, there were a lot of tours that were, you know, poorly priced and they take those tour deals and, you know, oh, what the hell, you know, get the money while it's here, and then they go out and they have the wrong prices and they play venues that aren't run by real promoters, and uh, surprise, surprise, you know? I mean, you pick up a piece of rotten fruit, it's rotten. <laughs> I mean, if you pick up a piece of good fruit, it's good. I mean, there weren't, so really, think about if there were any examples of shows that made sense and then ended up not doing well, there weren't. It was all these ones where, you know, people try to escape reality and try to book a show they shouldn't have, charge money they shouldn't have, in a venue that people don't want to go to, and it's like, you can't, you know, you can't negotiate reality. I mean, it's just, no, that will not do. Now, now when you do a multi, you know, a whole country full of those, and, and they all suck, then this, now it's on a huge level. Um, well, well, I think the key for me here is that for the last decade, well, I mean, it's been a trend for obviously longer than that, but I think we've seen uh, an exponential increase over the last decade. You look at where ticket prices were, uh, say, uh, 99, 2000, where they are now, uh, especially for those top tier shows, it's, it's, it's off, the, off the graph in terms of how much it's increased. Um, do you see that trend continuing? And if so, uh, is there a breaking point where the consumer just says, you know, we've, we've had enough? I mean, is the market? Well, they said it. They down? already said it. They said it last year. I yeah. mean, it's been creeping up, and then it was uh, multiples. As far as it, things being better this year, uh, what numbers are they basing that on? Do you know? Well, I mean, you know, again, uh, the lack of transparency in the uh, touring industry in the United States is, is appalling in a lot of ways. So well, because if, if you're talking about the, uh, the Live Nation financial report, if you read the fine print on their yeah. report, it says that they did not report um, pre-merger income last year for which they are now reporting the same period mm. as an increase, and they even tell you it's $400 million. So you read in the, you know, about these reports about how much more revenue there is this year, but if you put that $400 million back in last year, it's not a big increase. They do that stuff all the time, uh, you know, and, and a lot of people like I said, you know, about negotiating reality. I mean, it's like, this is all smoke and mirrors mm -hmm. for other reasons than putting on shows, good shows, and, and selling tickets. So it's not my game. I can't really, I yeah. don't know why they do that. But uh, I want to talk to Andrew. We're, we're uh, talking here about the notion that the way tickets are being sold over the next five to 10 years is changing. Uh, social networking is having a huge impact, potentially, on the way that's done. Um, at Ticketfly, how are you integrating 
uh, social media into what you're going to be doing in terms of looking at ticket sales over the next five years? Sure. You know, before I, before I hit that one, uh, I just had a thought on the, uh, the topic we were just discussing. Uh, I think the, uh, the concert industry and the live event industry is, is remarkable and, and perhaps has a singular ability to, uh, to consistently have short-term memory issues. I mean, the, the, the data that you just, you just supplied, it's, it's just staggering that we have these discussions year in and year out. I mean, 2010, all, all my promoter friends up here on the stage will attest to the fact that, and I think 2009 as well, that you know, ticket prices ran up and got totally out of control, and then no one bought tickets, and the economy cratered, and then everybody sits around talking about how you know, bad the music industry is. And uh, actually, I think in 10, prices probably pulled back a little bit, and the industry became a little bit more healthy. And then, you know, Polestar tells us, the Polestar data tells us that ticket prices are inching back up again. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, this is an industry that has to really sort of uh, find synchronicity on ticket prices and, um, and continue to offer value to ticket buyers. So, um, but I think that you know, when you hear that um, fewer tickets are being sold but more revenue is being generated, uh, you know, that's, that again sort of puts us in the red zone, I think. Yeah, it's a, it's a sobering statistic, I think, and it's been kind of the trend in the last few years. Yeah. Uh, fewer tickets sold but more revenue gained, and you know, that doesn't seem to be a positive statistic. Yeah, I mean, th th this industry in, in some ways or at, at certain times is self-defeating. You know, mm -hmm. we, uh, um, there's sort of equanimity seemed to be sort of creeping back into the industry in terms of, of ticket prices and people coming out to shows. And then what do we do? We raise ticket prices again. So I think, you know, we're talking about a sort of a have, have not scenario. Uh, people who can afford these tickets are buying them and not afraid to spend big money to buy them, but fewer people are going. Maybe is social media maybe a way to get some of these people sure. who aren't who don't have the big bucks yeah, back I was into say, the shows. You know, uh, my uh, my spiel there was mostly related to the uh, sort of high end of the, what I call the high end of the concert industry. Um, our business at Ticketfly, um, we our sort of bread and butter is the, is the middle market, which are theaters, festivals, clubs like that. We do some larger facilities, and we'll continue to grow in that direction. Um, but our business held up just fine in the downturn. Um, what we saw is that, um, especially in bad economies, just like the film industry, um, on the Friday night, you know, people want to, when the world is cratering around them, they want to go out, they want to drink beer, they want to see their favorite band. So our, our business was incredibly buoyant through that time. Um, and in regards to what, what I think we're going to see in the ticketing industry going forward, I, I think it's a very exciting time, actually. I think it's, um, it, I've been uh, doing this for a long time, and, and right now I think is probably the most exciting place we've ever been for ticket sellers, venues and promoters, and for ticket buyers. Um, and technology has brought us to a, to a very interesting place. Um, on the ticket seller side, you have more and better tools than have ever been available before. Um, some of the big themes we talk about, like, like integration, for instance. Um, historically, ticket sellers um, lived in a siloed world where they had ticketing and their website and, and Facebook and Twitter and their email newsletters that were totally not connected. And what that does is it creates inefficiencies, it costs promoters like Seth and Andrew a lot of time and money to to replicate data in all of those areas, and it, then it leaves the uh, promoter with a poor understanding of their ticket buyer because they, can't, we, they couldn't get good reporting on their email newsletter and how many of those converted into sales and things like that. Um, so now um, there's an integrated model which is taking hold where promoters enter data once and um, it gets pushed out. Um, and then for consumers, um, it's just a, a fantastic time. Um, you know, the proliferation of social media is one example. Um, consumers can now simply tell their friends which shows they're going to. Their friends can buy tickets from those links. Um, guys like us are working on ways to, to further incentivize ticket buyers to do that. And it also presents a, um, you know, a fantastic um, marketing channel for venues and promoters. And I think over time, over the next five years, we're going to see uh, promoters' uh, marketing dollars continue to decrease 
um, as, you know, because now all they need to do is, um, you know, sell tickets at a reasonable price to ticket buyers and have them uh, um, share that information with you their friends. You don't have to take, take out an ad. You can have the, the fans actually advertise it for you by telling their friends about something they're excited about. Yeah, I mean, that, that's exactly right. And I know, I know Michael has some good stories about, about uh, the string cheese incident on that subject as well. But, you know, one very recent example, which I found totally remarkable, um, a good friend of mine, uh, Jason Miller, at Live Nation in New York, uh, recently put on sale this, the Swedish House Mafia at Madison Square Garden and sold the whole show out via Facebook pre-sale only. Wow. So I think that talks about the, the rise of electronic dance music and, um, you know, the power of Facebook, which is just overwhelming. And, you know, if, if I think a few years ago, if you, you said that, um, you know, someone was going to sell out a Swedish house mafia gig at Madison Square Garden uh, via pre-sale Facebook only, they would have told you you were crazy. But uh, 20 minutes, apparently. <laughs> Mike, you've uh, been a real innovator in, in terms of uh, direct a fan. Uh, with ticket sales. Uh, string cheese incident back in the day with uh, Madison House was a huge uh, innovative band in, ter in, in terms of doing that. Um, more of that in the future? Um, and how can, that, how can that model be refined to reflect you know, all this other competition that's out there right now? Well, I, I think for sure more of that in the future. You know, and I think it's when we started with string cheese, actually Dreskin at that point was one of the first people on it with us. And we, when we built the first string cheese ticketing site, we knew that what the idea was and we knew what we were going for and we actually could never get the mechanics of it to work. And then we did. And here we are 15 years later, kind of, I'm with Andrew, we keep having the same kind of crazy conversation over and over and over again. And, and all, again, speaking for the string cheese incident, all we did was look at what the Grateful Dead did and then we fished it after them and tried to cherry pick as many of the good ideas and lose as many of the shitty ideas. And that gave us a relatively decent blueprint how to move forward. Mm -hmm. And what I think the, the scariest thing that's happening now in the industry is that I now talk to people who will say to me, hey, when's the show going on sale? And I'll go, okay, October 1st. And they go, no, when is it going to actually go on sale? <laughs> so there's a whole societal movement where people won't buy tickets on the on sale. They're just going to wait because they know at some point the ticket's going to come back around severely discounted to the point, and I think that's when we get into real deep shit. And I don't know. I'm sure Seth does everything he can to fight against it, and there are little pockets of places where promoters have drawn a line and won't discount, but I think that it's, it's potentially the most cancerous part mm -hmm. of the whole thing. And it all goes back to exactly what Seth said, which is, you, hey, manager, you probably priced it wrong. Hey, band, you're in the wrong building. And I mean, discounting is basically a means to correct something you did wrong. And if you don't do it wrong in the first place, then, right. uh, you don't have to discount. So, Andrew, you want to jump in here? Yeah, I just, um, bands, I think it's really bad for bands when that happens. And what you find, um, what we found, we've been pursued at Jam by, by pretty much every discounter uh, has come by and asked us for their business. And... Fortunately for us, we were not in a, in a position where we've ever needed to do that, nor would we ever think that the bands would want to do that because all of a sudden people are perceiving them as a band that they can go to and see them for half the price. And what I've learned over time is that the only place where it's really sort of regularly happening is in the world of when you've got a Live Nation tour or, um, as you know, they teamed up with Groupon, and uh, to my knowledge, when you are a li if you are a Live Nation tour, you basically sign away your, as a band, you sign away your rights to dictate price, so that if it, a time comes where Live Nation's paid you X, and you want to, uh, they can then choose later to put you for on sale, essentially. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a, a bad move for, uh, for bands. Uh John, uh, fantastic time for consumers. A Andrew uh, brought that point out, that uh, this is actually a better time than ever for, for consumers in terms of choice. How, what's your, what's your uh, take on it? Uh, I think it's a, there are opportunities in terms of choice. There's certainly great ways of finding out what shows are coming around. Um, I think the technology creates some of those opportunities, the, the smart marketing 
um, promote some of those opportunities uh, and efficiencies. I think the challenge of the technology is, um, and, and something we've spent a fair amount of time on, is um, when it's misused in the context of transparency, or when it's not used in the context of transparency, um, when consumers um, find that they go to the box office, they go to the online box office to buy tickets to a show, um, and whether it's because of the fantastic pre-sale um, or because of you know certain holdbacks and things like that, um, that was not my phone. Um, <laughs> um, consumers are are you know pissed off, um, and they're frustrated by the experience of buying the tickets when they don't understand what that experience has been dictated and and, and who's doing the dictating. Um, I think that um, the other place where technology can be um, very anti-consumer uh, is when the ticket industry decides to follow the recording industry and uses technology to control the uh, quote redistribution of the tickets or the rights that you get, and so uh, you know we here's heard the DRM. Pandora's box. Okay. Well, well we heard yeah. DRM in this room for years and years when mm -hmm. record companies were trying to lock the sound recording to your hard drive, when they were trying to lock it to your to one device, things like that, and they gave up and realized that this was treating their consumers, their customers as thieves, wasn't a way to make money. Um, now we're in an environment where um, Live Nation is coming out with their paperless ticketing, and Veritex coming out with their digital paperless ticketing. We're having will-call only shows that create all sorts of challenges for consumers um, who might not be able to go to a show because um, if they have four kids like me, um, they have problems at home on occasion. If they travel for business, like some of us here in this room, I don't know if anybody's here from Washington except for me and Seth, you know, they travel for business, they, they can't get to the show. They're buying shows six weeks, 12 weeks in advance, um, and they're being told they can't resell their tickets, they can't transfer their tickets, or they can't even change the name. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, it's, it's even harder to get into the Radiohead show at Roseland Ballroom than it is to get on United Airlines flight, because you have to show your original purchasing credit card and your photo ID. United only requires the photo ID. So the trend is, uh, you're saying, let's, let's have this system where the person who buys a ticket uh, is, the only, is the person who actually uh, uses the ticket, you're saying that's not a great idea. That it should I be a free market, you should be able to take that ticket, sell it or share it with whomever you wish, and uh, it, it, it's out of the artist's hands, it's out of the venue's hands, it's really the fan's choice as to how they... Of course, when we say fan, you know, that can also be a broker. Uh, that can be somebody who got that ticket through you know, for means other than fandom. Well, if you, if you try to assign um, intent to your consumer base, um, rather than saying, thank you, please come again, um, you're creating some real challenges. Mm -hmm. and, and I would flip it around saying, rather than being out of anybody's hands, when the folks who are with me on this panel decide that a show is worth X, or a ticket is worth X, and they get X, the answer should be great. Mm -hmm. I'm thrilled, maybe I can sell some more. Rather than saying, thank you for your money, and by the way, my hand is still in your pocket. Mm -hmm. And if you dare... Well, but it would be fine if the ticket uh, consumers were the fans you're talking about. The problem is that these other people have hijacked that whole routine as a means of selling tickets for more money than they originally intended. And I don't think you can get rid of that unless you um, outlaw selling tickets uh, above face value or a certain amount above face value. And I think that's the only way this is going to change. And if, if you're really sincere about, you know, the intent of fans being able to transfer tickets, that'll be fine with them because they're just trying to get rid of their ticket, if you're get their in, money back. If they're not trying to make a profit on it. it the, pro, the challenge of, of even going down that road is how do you define face value? We've heard about Groupon. We've heard about discounting. It's printed on the ticket. It, it is not. I can tell you that when I get my season tickets to the Washington Wizards, which I wasted my money on for five years. Well, then you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I remember being, being blown away because they were $15 per seat per game for top deck, it was personal money, top, le top level, fifth row, right? And I got the tickets in the mail, and they said on them $48. And I thought, wow, I can flip these on Craigslist or StubHub for 30 bucks, and somebody thinks he's getting a deal, and I'm getting a deal. Face value doesn't exist anymore in the ticketing industry. We all well, know we're going to dynamic pricing. Well, the same sports sports as well fantasy as laws I'm thinking of could force people to put face value on the ticket. So, so. We're, I take exception with the idea that you think we're all going to dynamic pricing. Um, uh, Are we, you not going to dynamic pricing? We as a, as a company uh, have not had one show where we've ever used dynamic pricing. We are working with bands that, uh, in many cases, very much care about 
that fact that their fans, who they care about much, want to go to the show. They want their fans to go at, and pay a face value ticket. Mm -hmm. And they want to know that that person that bought the ticket is the person that paid face value and is going to the show. And what, what you're proposing is that essentially tickets are commodities and that whomever pays the highest price is the, is the entity, that is, the, is the person that should go. So you've got the haves and the have-nots. And, and, and as far as the way bands, uh, I, f I feel the way the bands are uh, successful and build fan bases and respect is when they let their fans know that they're not being treated as simply uh, that. Um, and that's why we care so much about um, this issue at JAM, and I'm sure Seth agrees as well. And um, so John works for a, a company, or he's a lobbyist, and he works for this organization that's funded by uh, eBay and StubHub. And when we do things like uh, Will Call Only, which has been around for as long as I've been in the business, which is 20 years, or this new thing, which is essentially a technological version of Will Call Only, which is uh, paperless ticketing, which not only Ticketmaster does, Ticketfly does, eTix is now doing. Um, everybody's arms go up in that industry because they're all of a sudden cut out of the mix. So the premise that it's a fan-generated uh, uh, opposition is, I think, a false preposition. And until uh, bots, which are, um, I can speak to firsthand, uh, ravaging the on sales of major shows. Could you uh, explain a bot for those who do not know what those are? OK, so uh, there is a extremely intelligent group of people that created uh, programs that uh, can go online and buy tickets in very rapid fashion using people's names and credit cards that they've already pre-approved, sort of like a, a, a cabal of sorts, and um, regularly uh, and speedily beat human beings. I, uh, it was a long time ago, but if you remember the Jeopardy uh, challenge against uh, Watson or the uh, IBM computer, Watson was always pressing the button faster, and that's what's going on in, in, in the industry. So the premise that we're going to go towards this direction where we are not allowed to have any, any way to let bands fulfill their vision, which is ultimately what we're doing. We don't do this will call only or restrict will call for certain shows. It's at band choice. That's, it's a false preposition and, uh, proposition until that issue is handled, and it's, it's total exploitation right now. I don't believe that putting shows on sale should be the same as issuing an IPO, and then the stock goes out, and you watch them go up and down. I just, that's not, it's not good for the fans at all. Um, it's not good for the industry, because now there's a bunch of people paying way too much money for shows, so they can't afford other shows. And, uh, you know, the, the attempt to corral this and make it yours is, it's just not uh, a business I want to get into. I want to, I want to get Peter in here. Um, what, what, where do the artists stand on this, Peter, uh, in terms of how much control should they have or do they want over how much the ticket is sold for and to whom? I, I think I speak more um, as a recovering economist than anything else. <laughs> um, and it seems to me that the... Any, in lots of ways, if you try and defeat supply and demand, you're going to get screwed. And it seems to me that artists have to realize that uh, if they charge, want to charge too little for a concert, uh, more, you know, less than the market is willing to pay, uh, given the venue and given the demand and so on, they've got two choices. They can either put on another show or they can watch the tickets go up on the secondary ticket mar market. I don't think there's any way of stopping the secondary ticket market any more than there was a way of stopping uh, people moving files around online. I think it's a reflection of the technology. I don't think it's particularly desirable. I look back with fondness to the good old days when you know, a ticket was seven and sixpence and you could count the people in and multiply by seven and sixpence and you knew what the gross was. Those days have gone. And I think, in a sense, we are really very much like where the airlines are. I think the reference to United Airlines was quite interesting because that always seems to me that's the problem. We have 
Once you've decided you're going to do that venue, you have a fixed capacity and you want to sell it out. I mean, I think most artists want to play to a full house. Now, Seth is very good, I know, at spotting what he thinks he can do and he's, he's very good at guessing that, you know, that, that artist will sell that many tickets and he'll make that offer and he usually gets it more or less right. And, I'm sure, and Jam do the same. And because they're crafty operators and been doing it a long time, and they know their game. But I think in a lot of other areas, people don't know their game. And that's why we get this whole gaming going on. And I don't think really we could... It, it, it's a combination of economic reality and greed. And I think both the artists and the people in the industry are relentlessly greedy and trying to squeeze out more money than is there. I mean, I disagree. I think your premise is that where the supply and the demand curve meet is really where we are, or where we, where we should be. And like I said before, um, we do have tools right now to avoid that from happening. And I think it's really bad for, I mean, when, like you said, in the good old days, when prices were what they were, the music industry flourished. And I think once we get to that point where it's all about economy and not about art, then we're in big trouble. The difference between the music files was nobody, they were trading those for free. These are, this is people trying to profit from getting a hold of that ticket and controlling it. And now the only way, you know, the analogy would be, if the only way you're going to listen to this music is if you buy this file from me. So the only way you're going to get that ticket is if you buy it from them. They're not, they're not sharing that ticket. But let's, let's talk about this in a couple of different ways. First of all, on the bot issue, I agree 100%. We've come out against bots. We've come out urging for anti-bot legislation and stronger penalties and more attorney general investigation. There's no doubt. We, we believe that consumers should have fair access to face value tickets, and that means nobody should jump in line, like in second grade in front of the water fountain, right. nor should they jump in line with a computer. So, so let's, let's agree on that and move on. Well, we can't. But, hang we can't on, hang on. on. Hang on one sec. The second, the second issue is who's doing the reselling and who's profiting off the reselling. Yeah. Let's be honest here. Ticketmaster has the second largest exchange, and Ticketmaster's goal is not to prohibit reselling. Ticketmaster's goal is to limit reselling to, quote, authorized resellers. Now, Ticketmaster also owns the largest touring company. They own the largest, the most successful and most profitable music agency. They own the largest venue operating company. They own the largest ticketing company, and they own the second largest reselling company. So the goal of Ticketmaster, with all due respect, is not to satisfy the artist's political whims for, for fairly pricing tickets. So that, and that's, an, that's another issue that we can talk about, is how artists are making economic judgments about whether a firefighter can get a ticket or somebody who's a, a working mom can get a ticket versus whether the student can get a ticket because he has, doesn't have to go to class that day so he can sit online. But the issue here is who's profiting off reselling? And if the question is, you know, I'm sitting here, first of all, you know, StubHub is a consumer-to-consumer -consumer exchange. Is StubHub our primary financier? Absolutely. Is StubHub the reason we have 40,000 or 50,000 people that have signed up to support our mission? Absolutely not. So, I, you know, Ticketmaster is up here sucking the blood of the artists, sucking the blood of the venues, sucking the blood, you know, out of, out of the consumers, and you're sitting here telling me that that's the way we want to do things in the future? Well, I got some news for you. Uh, Seth, too. Seth works with Andrew and Ticketfly. Jam? We have venues that we own and operate, the Vic, the Riv. Uh, we work at the Aragon, uh, the Park West. We don't use Ticketmaster. We use other companies. And we're doing, so what I'm proposing here has nothing at all to do with what, what Ticket, Ticketmaster's dominant position is in the marketplace, or Live Nation for that matter. Um, I've asked, uh, it's, so back to your point about bots and that you agree. Uh, I think the premise is, uh, is false. If my preposition is you wouldn't be sit here sitting at this table working for the organization that you do if bots weren't so successful. And that really? I do. I really believe that. I think there's so much money that, that, that scalpers make by using bot technology and therefore then using uh, marketplaces like StubHub to sell their tickets. That's, where the, that's why there's so much, that's why there's so will much attention. Will you work with me? Pardon? Will you work with me to identify and track and monitor, and actually, for the for the arguably the very first time, to get real data on bots, and because if we can figure out if we can figure out which Russian folks are uploading music, and which kids are down, and which grandmothers or their grandchildren are downloading music, we can figure out where I, these bots I are coming from. I have some news for you. There is uh, 
there are laws on the books already about bots and how they're illegal. And so you were fighting to get your laws passed in the state of Minnesota where there are already bots laws passed, but uh, there is not a technological means to do so. The only, uh, it, uh, to, to, to my knowledge, it would take, I would love, to, love for it to be the case because it would stop me from having to go through a, a ticket sales list of 10,000 people and then cancel 1,000 uh, tickets uh, because they're grossly, uh, obviously, are uh, uh, broker and bot purchases. It's just wrong. So we can figure out where the pedophiles are, the music uploaders, the music downloaders, the movie uploaders, and the music downloaders, but not the bot guys. Uh, yes, if you if you have any great ideas, I'm I would think it'd be well, awesome. If it's Don't not bots, I've asked this question a million times and nobody ever answers it. Where are they getting these tickets? Where's who getting tickets? The the scalping companies that have you know huge allotments of tickets, including Ticketmaster. Well, you know where many of them have gotten the tickets for years and years. They've gotten them from promoters and venue owners and the guy who works in the ticket office. And agents and managers. Right. And you know, when, I, Katie, when Katy Perry's touring contract says, I can hold back as many tickets as I want for any show that I want, and literally she names in her touring contract StubHub so she can put them up on StubHub for four and five times X, and then, you know, you're going to, and I'm not saying you, and then the promoter or, or the band is going to scream about scalpers and brokers. Come on. I think this is, this well, is this, the, you talk about cabals. That's, that's the ultimate that's cabal the and the ultimate lack it's, of it's, transparency it, it, screws consumers. I have some news for you. It doesn't come close. Uh, it doesn't come close to the volume of what, uh, if, if there are examples of that, the day-to-day -day amount of, of, of sales that come through a computerized, automated, we're going to beat the human being purchases does not come close. So you're trying to paint this as though uh, there are sort of the nefarious uh, uh, con you know, people pulling strings at the very top of the music industry and work. And I'm telling you, it's not the case. Yeah, let, you, you do have, I'm sorry, Andrew, I just wanted to follow up on that. Uh, you do have data, though, that shows you who bought every, every ticket, right, Andrew? I mean, is that That's, pretty much you On any tell? given show, you can access. So is there a sure. way to deduce from that data, you know, what's a bot sale and what, what is a, you know, just a regular person well, buying that ticket? Well, it's, it's, it's an educated guess. Uh, when we do a show in Chicago and, and 30 tickets are sold in Torrance, California, I have a strong belief that that in a very high volume on sale where things sold out like that, then I know I've, I've you got, got a bot. strong idea. Yes. Andrew? Absolutely. I mean, and also just to, to, to rewind a little bit here, just to correct uh, something that John said, um, I believe that he said that StubHub is a fan-to-fan -fan marketplace, which is partially true. Um, and I, I want to uh, walk somewhat gingerly here because I do like the StubHub folks. Um, and I also uh, agree with Peter that uh, I'm a big believer in free market economics. Um, but the reality is, is that roughly, I'm going to say 50% of StubHub's business is to be a channel for scalpers. Okay, so let's call it what it is. Let's, you know, let's hit this head on here. Um, and, you know, I, and quite honestly, the, this argument that, you know, that, the, the uh, Fan Freedom Project, they put forth this argument that, you know, by not, by doing paperless ticketing or will call only ticketing, it really, it really, you know, limits the, the, um, the, the working people and all these people who have jobs and they can't, you know, go online to get tickets. And I mean, I don't know about you all, but that just breaks down for me, you know, pretty darn quickly. And I, I think at the end of the day, you know, my view is, LCD sound system, you know, after their Madison Square Garden show sold out and it went, you know, largely to scalpers and everything. They put up the four shows at Terminal 5, we'll call only, Radiohead at Roseland. If the bands want to sell their tickets in that manner, it, it's, an imperfect, um, it's an imperfect science and, and an imperfect industry and we all know that. But I just don't see how you go to Radiohead and say, you know what, you can't do that. We're going we're gonna to outlaw that. So. Um, you know, I think uh, I don't think that this argument's going to get much traction. A, a general question, which sure. what, what I've found is very difficult on the artist side is, and I've yet to see someone who, who's done it, or I don't even know if it's possible, but is it possible for a band to tour across America without somehow getting dinged through the Ticketmaster Live Nation system? Chicago's a unique oasis. Seth creates, you know, aisles that it's, it's possible to do it, but if you're trying to string together 30, 40, 50 shows to be a viable touring artist, 
I would put it out there that it, it's impossible. And until that gets addressed, all leverage is out the window, and there's no real ability. At, for me, the problem's not the secondary ticketing, it's the primary ticketing that's yeah. so screwy. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, I would, I would suggest that in a sense to go back, I mean, I'm not a great free market person. I mean, I just accept the realities of the market. I'm not in favor of it particularly. I mean, I'm an old, I'm an old lefty, you know. But the reality is that, you know, if you charge too little for a ticket initially uh, compared with the demand and the capacity, you're going to have a problem. And equally, if you charge too much. And I, I'm very attracted. I don't know how it might work or what it might work, but it would seem to me that if instead of putting out all your tickets on day one and saying, I've sold out, because that's the problem, it seems to me, that the managers and the artists like to think we sold out in two seconds. If we sort of started thinking a bit more about leaking the tickets out, seeing what the market is, and then varying the prices a little bit more, it would become much more difficult for the, 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 the pure sort of uh, uh, the pure bot people or whatever they are, I mean, these guys who so are... So you're saying dynamic pricing um, based on holding back some tickets and with what's left and what to sell them for, as opposed to dynamic pricing with tickets that are already sold yes, now. Yes, yes. In other so, words, that maybe initially the ticket is, is uh, $10 and you see it's going well and it goes up to $20 and two days before the gig, you realize you're down, you know, you've got another 50 tickets you could sell, so maybe they go out for $5. But the problem I with mean, that is... I mean, that's what we used to do in some ways, when we charged less if you bought your ticket up front than when you bought it on the day. Well, you just said that you were going to discount it on no, the day. No, if you're not sold out. But Britain. you see, then you get a bunch of pissed off people, and rightly so, that bought tickets, dutifully, you know, bought them on time, paid face for whatever we call that. That's what we do. Uh, yeah, that, money. You create and, uh, a scenario where they're waiting for the sale to go on. And then sale, you get right? blogs filled with, this sucks. I paid yeah. 50 bucks and now it's for 20. I'm never doing that again. Right. And yeah. then you heard yeah, your... But hold on. When you get on an airplane, you know right. that no one is paying the same price that you paid. That's right. You know that everyone's paid a different price. You don't know what they paid, but you know that you paid that because you wanted to go on that day, and that was the price it was for that plane on that day. And it was quite clear... And if you liked, you might go in on the last minute and find that you can get that ticket really cheap. Other times, you might find that, you know, you So you people might it learn up. that, hey, I paid a lot, but I know I got my ticket. Yeah. Flying, but, flying but, is a but, it, but the point is then, in a way, we all know what the actual gross is. What pisses me off as a manager is the notion that the, no one knows what the gross of the gig is. No one knows who's making what. You don't know if it's the promoter who's, who's stoking the yeah, there's no second sound ticket for market the or whether it's the really. bots. Or, so Seth, so who, who is rigging boxes? that market? Well, we work Seth? very hard hold to on, keep Hold that on a mystery. second. I want to get uh, uh, Andrew has been dying so, to say something. Yes. Uh, Greg, you might remember this when we did the Rolling Stones at Double Door. Yes. In probably 94, 95. Ticket price was $7. Do you remember, is the premise that the, the, the Rolling Stones don't have a right to do that? I think that's what you guys, that's what I'm hearing, is yeah. that they don't have a right to put their show on sale and make sure that everybody that bought the ticket, hey, uh, that's you, what you're saying. And no, it, I'm saying if you can do that, good luck to you. I'm what, just that's saying, what I'm saying we can you do won't it. get away with it. In the but end, it, it will break, and people will find ways around it. If, the, if you have a huge, unfulfilled demand, for a show at that price, they will find a way around it. And you're going to be constantly running around, shutting doors when the horse has bolted. You know, that's inevitably what's going to happen, in my view. But, I mean, if you're, if you're, I mean, I have to say what I said initially. If you know your game and you know what the market is for the artist in your market, then you can say, well, that's the right price. I've had this discussion with you. If you're very right. honorable, if you're a band and you really believe in your heart of heart, you know what? My, my concert might be worth 500 bucks in the open market. I only want to charge 50. And I'm going to make it so that you have to show the purchasing credit card when you walk in the door. You are, and, and, and you all have to show it together. Think about it, right? You make the woman who drove up from Virginia to bring her nephew into the Radiohead concert in New York. And you know what? Was that worth $50 to the band? She paid $500 in gas instead and $5,000 in her time if she was employed. 
You've, you've changed the economics yeah, of but, it. But you, haven't, you haven't ended, you, you've limited the artist's private price, and they feel good, but you've only moved the money in different places. You haven't, you, the gas company profited, yeah, but, but no, the band consider, didn't. Consider the options, right? So um, do you think the, all the fans going to the show and the band would rather have a few people inconvenienced, or would you rather have that kid not go at all because tickets were $5,000 on StubHub? I think that if you're willing Dubois to sell shows. your ticket for 50 bucks. And also, let, let me add, by, by the way, I, I, do, I, I, agree with, I agree with what a lot of you guys are saying. I mean, I think that this, this industry, and I think we all know this, has terrible pricing inefficiency problems, yeah. right? We all know that. And that's why there's a lot of talk about dynamic pricing and yield management. And I think over the next few years, this industry will explore a lot of different ways to price their tickets. Um, and I, I agree with that. And I also think that I agree with, with Peter. You're never going to stop the, the secondary market. You know, as long as, um, as long as there's an inefficient pricing in place, um, there will be tickets bought above face value and below face value, you know, on StubHub and, and other um, exchanges, which I, I think is fine. Um, I'll tell you one, one sort of um, uh, moderately revolutionary idea that, that we have, and some people love it, some people hate it. Seth might hit me, I don't know, we'll, we'll find out in a minute. But, um, you know, we think you're not going to be able to stop the secondary market. And so what, what we posit is the stakeholders, the promoters, the artists, the managers, and the agents mm. should share in the revenue yes. in the secondary market. And so guys like us are working on deals with some of the secondary players where, every, you know what, Meriwether Post Pavilion tickets do get sold in the secondary market. Well, let's, let's capture some of that revenue. Let's pass it along to Seth and let's have him share it with the bands. Well, you're already having this done. You brought up Katy Perry. It's not just Katy Perry. There's a number of artists that are doing this where they're pulling tickets back and reselling them on the market. A number of stories have come on about that. This goes to this issue of control. Who's controlling the ticket? Does Listen. the artist have a stake? If they can charge seven bucks for a show as the Rolling Stones did at Double Door, they can also charge, say, hey, wait a minute, I'm going to take this $200 ticket and resell it for 450 because I can you, get that. You're talking about, Andrew, you're talking about nothing any different than when scalpers used to come to me at shows and say, hey, hey, give me some tickets, I'll cut you in. It's the same thing. It's just well, more the, efficient the, now. The, I said no to them then, and I'll say no not, to you tomorrow. The only difference is we're not asking you for the tickets. We're just saying if some kid bought a ticket and he's selling it in the secondary market, why, should, you know, why shouldn't the artist share in that revenue? Because that's counting and, and, other people's money. And that's how this whole thing started, is people looked at other people making money on their concerts and saying, well, I should get my piece of that. Exactly. But Andrew, there's nothing, the question, I, I got to tell you, I'm all in favor of you know, the promoter working with the venue, working with their primary ticketer to create a secondary offering that allows people to, to sell tickets. What I'm opposed to is, are you going to put price floors on there? Because there are some ticket issuers that put price floors on their secondary offering. And why do they put price floors? Because there's still tickets left in inventory. So basically, the show's tanking. I bought the ticket for, or, or even if it's not tanking, even if there's 10 tickets left, I bought my ticket for 100 bucks. I got called out of town, or my kid is sick, or my baby, I couldn't get a babysitter. I want to flip that ticket for 50 or 60 or 70, whatever I can get for it. Are you going to let me, or are you going to force me to sell it for 100 bucks plus more service charge? And I know you're not the service charge king, so I don't take it personally. Uh -huh. But so that's one issue. The second issue is, Seth, do you sell box seats? Do you sell season, season seats at Meriwether Post? Yes. So I buy four season seats. I have four tickets to 40 shows over the course of your summer. Uh -huh. If every artist said, I'm not allowed to resell my seats. I'm now screwed. We don't I, let those I people gave, resell gave, their seats. What's that? We don't let those people resell their seats. They How have to come pick them up because we have seats. their names and they have to come pick them up. Personally? They, yeah. With their purchasing credit card? When they and their come photo that ID? night. I mean, there's only 100 of them, so it's not that big a deal. But it's, it's, we don't, in fact, we've caught them selling their tickets and we've revoked their, their suites. I, you know, if I write you a check for 10 grand for a season pass, I'm offended if you think I can't. Well, then I'm you go don't have to buy it, but that's the rules if you want to buy it from me. You don't have to do business with him. Uh, Peter, I want to ask you about that secondary ticketing issue with the artists. This again goes to the, you know, because I think the artists, it's, 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 we're talking about promoters, we're talking about ticket servicing agencies here, we're talking about the fan, and we're talking about the artists. They're all part of this equation. So Katy Perry has built into her deal, and other artists too, I'm not just singling her out, you know, pulling out a certain number of tickets, I have the right to resell those in the secondary market because I know I can get hundreds of dollars over face value on the secondary market, and all that money goes to me. 
Um, is that an artist's right? Do you think that's, that's okay? Well, I, as good a person as anyone, but I would have thought that the rational, sensible thing is that we should all be in it together. The promoter and the artist should actually work together at achieving whatever the desired goal is. Is the desired goal to get a screw as much money out as possible, or is it to get the right sort of audience? Is it to sell it out? I mean, it seems to me that what I find difficult is the opaqueness, the fact that you don't know what's going on, that you know that there's all sorts of stuff going on, there's secondary tickets, and, and there's a suspicion that, that, that the promoter's selling the tickets, or there's a su suspicion that the artist is selling the tickets, or the agent, or whatever, and the fan tickets, and all the rest of it. I mean, I think that we need to rethink our business in the context of the, the bloody digital revolution, which I... Uh, I, I am not really very good at, I don't particularly like, but I accept that it's there. And the good old days when a record was cost, uh, you know, cost uh, 20, 27 and sixpence in English money, uh, those days are gone. And, and, and the seven and sixpenny ticket to go and see the, the Rolling Stones, they're gone. It's a different world. And with the computers, people can play games. And they will play games. So somehow or another, can we find ways in which the agent, the artist, and the promoter, and the venue can, between them, work together to generate the most income for the greatest satisfaction of their artists to everyone's reasonable satisfaction. But Peter, isn't the, the answer to that is no. If the artist, in today's day and age, if I want to put a band out on a $25 ticket across America, by the time the ticket actually ends up in the consumer's hand, in 80% of the places that we have to play, it could be 40 bucks. It could be 45 bucks. There are shows, Andrew's told stories about going to see a, a show at the Troubadour, a $15 show with a $15 service charge. And, th and that's, that is the reality of what we're dealing with. And that's, for me, where the whole train goes off the, the line, is that I think it's mostly the artist's fault, mostly the manager's fault, most of the time, because that's where it all starts. But until we can unravel the fact that if I want to have a fucking $25 ticket and that's what I want the kid to pay, there's no way to do it. I think there is. The only way to do it is to have to work endlessly. And if you're, if you're a victim of your success and you're so successful that, it, that people are willing to pay 50 bucks for your $25 ticket, then do more gigs and you burn, you burn the, 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 the secondary I'm, ticket guy. I'm like, I think we're having a different argument. I'm all for if someone wants to, if the band wants the ticket to be 25 bucks, there's now a third party that gets in the middle of it with their own fully scaled out economic model that gets bolted onto what you want. That as the artist or the fan, and in most cases the promoter in the building, you have no say to it because there's contracts in place where the service charge can get set. And until that changes. I'm with you. I mean, I'm totally with you. That, that whole racket with Ticketmaster really pisses me off. But that is, it's, it's a $25 not, it's not, ticket, and people are paying right, $40. But we talk about all it being that, that Ticketmaster racket. That is the reality. That is the policy now that, again, on, on almost all the shows, you know, they that's what it is. They renewed 95% of their contracts since the merger. Before the merger, they only renewed 85% of their contracts. Now they renewed 95% of the country. This is with the pro-competitive rules that the Justice Department put in. Yeah, um, I mean, we're victims of, 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 it seems to me we're victims, so it's the public and the artists, and, and to some extent the promoters are victims of a protection racket. Well, let's think about this. Radiohead at Roseland sold their tickets through... Ticketmaster. Ticketmaster. Now, Ro Radiohead is one of the few bands in the position, and I know they have the right intent and they want to do the right thing, yet... Unless someone like that, till the day that someone tries again and steps up to break that system, it will continue on well, ad nauseum. So then the, the issue here that we all keep thing. discussing is whether to join it or fight it, basically. Well, I'll tell you. I think we have to build our own system to some extent. I mean, Mumford and Sons in the UK sold three, 4,000 capacity shows themselves through their website, and they, were, they just bought, they forewalled it. So well, at least they know what's to like, some extent, there are, there are companies that are using, I know Jam's using a lot of, you know, non-Ticketmaster, uh, you know, outlets for uh, a number of their shows. Andrew here has got a, you know, with we've Ticketfly. Taken, we've taken like 30 Ticketmaster clients in the past couple years. 
Yeah, so I mean, it's slowly but surely, there, 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 there does seem to be a market out there. Uh, frankly, I thought it was going to be a lot worse after the merger. I thought it was just going to completely gut well, yesterday, Irving the market. Got on Clear Channel's board, so who knows what's going to happen? Yeah, well, that's yeah. well, good lord. I think that um, I think that uh, you know, up here are some good examples of, of how the industry is changing, and I think it's going to continue to move in this direction. Um, you know, Seth is a great example. Um, he's one of the, the biggest and best promoters in the country, and uh, you know, he he. Uh, put a stake in the, in the ground and said, you know, I'm not going to use Ticketmaster anymore. So he's, he's pulled all right. of his business away. The folks at JAM use uh, um, uh, some really great guys in Chicago called eTix. Um, we've taken 30 Ticketmaster clients. Um, and I think that, you know, the, the, the democratization of, uh, of the Internet is happening, and I think that it's going to continue, or uh, Ticketmaster is going to continue to see erosion in their business. Right. And, and also, just one last thing, I mean, it's worth pointing out that, that AEG, the second largest event promoter in the world, is now selling its own tickets. Um, and um, what agency are you, they using? Do you Outbox. know? Is it well? They, Outbox. Their their uh, their company is called Access. Mm. Axs dot com. Okay. Um, we could keep going here, but obviously we would like to get some audience uh, participation. If you guys want to jump in with some questions, is there anybody? We have a microphone that is roaming. That's the one. Right there. Okay. I think, I think this whole resale thing, personally, is kind of like a high five problem because people are selling tickets to start with. So for all the people that aren't selling tickets, you know, how do you start when you want to have like a ten dollar ticket at Irving Plaza, let's say, and the Ticketmaster surcharge is twelve bucks, and there's no box office. So there's there's those type of issues. But we had Yahoo Out Loud in 2000. Seth and Andrew were promoters. Our ticket price at the Aragon was a dollar seventy-five. The ticket price to the consumer was ten bucks. Seth, we were at the schoolroom with you with Weezer. And I think our ticket price there was two dollars and ten cents. And we went to Ticketmaster and said we'll give you five dollars a ticket. We sold everything through Yahoo's site. And after that, Ticketmaster said you can only sell ten percent of the house. They made that rule like a month later. Because no one thought that Yahoo would sell any tickets. This was in two thousand. So my question, though, is more about the information. Who owns the information? Like, let's say I'm managing a band. They sell out your room. We want to come back to your city and play again a year later. And my question is, we want to message everybody that came to the last show. And what I hear is, you can't. Because Ticketmaster owns the information, or the venue owns the information, or perhaps the guy who put his ass on the line and paid for the information was totally a risk, often doesn't. That's right. How come the promoter doesn't own the information? How come the band doesn't own the information? How come we can sell out a, a thousand tickets, come back a year later, and only sell 500, and do this thing that should be for free, like message all the people that came last time? Because people that buy tickets are very active. They're buying two, four. They're buying, they're getting their friends, they're getting reimbursed. They're not a passive consumer. So how, is, does anyone think about that, or is that just yeah, something that's not there? It's very disappointing for us at JAM. Uh, there are numbers of venues that we work with now um, that will not share our pur purchaser information with us, uh, no, venues that we do huge numbers of shows with. It's really hard. Um, that means that we can't then share that information with the artist either. Anytime an artist asks us for information that we have on purchasers, uh, it's, uh, can, it's the, as long as it's buttoned down on the ticket sale uh, terms of service, so to speak, and that it's all legal, which it is, we share with the artist. But we're, we're seeing venues, uh, very unfortunately, that withhold. And, uh, so you have to go back. You have to go back to just advertising all brand new again. Either that it's, or... It takes so much time to find somebody especially older people, you know, let them know something's going on. It's, you know, a, it's, a, it's you by far... You find them again, and you got, you're taking out an ad in the reader, and you could have been just pressing send to the people that bought it last time. Isn't that frustrating? Yeah, that's, that's, cor that's correct. Venues, uh, they, 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 I, I would say, hide behind privacy policy. Um, I think it's more so a function of they just want to... Uh, they don't want to empower us, uh, which means they're ultimately not empowering the artist. We have to fall back on things like Andrew's spearheading 
which is in secondary market, I mean, secondary, excuse me, uh, social networking, uh, which can really make up some ground, but email still is, is king if you have those names. I, I'm not commenting because uh, we don't seem to have that problem in DC very much. Um, most of the venues you're allowed to use your ticketing contract at, so then you have the info and you can give it to people. When I give it to bands, I always specify they can't give it to my competitors. They can't share that then with Ticketmaster. But I've seen um, on deal memos before dates are confirmed from bands say, you know, and you have to give us this info. So the time to get that is before you book the show and you tell these venues that are holding out, um, if you want the show, you're going to have to give us that. It sounds like it, it's a series of contracts here. You've got to have a contract between the, the promoter and the venues that they're booking at that this information will be shared. Yeah. It takes three to tango here uh, as opposed to just a... a Right. Well, that's that's the other well, part. Well, not in my case, but. Right. Well, no, no, that's true, and that's. Well, that information's power. That's why they want to hold on to it. That's why they're not sharing it. it that's that's really it, it's a, it's a great point. It's very important information, and that's why they're hanging on to it. But yeah, I mean, it's all it's it's worth pointing out that that's the old school model. Uh, I mean, for instance, uh, when we sell a ticket, our clients, they own the data, they have full access to it, and we encourage them to share it with the artists. But that's up to them. Anybody else for, with a question? Got something down here in front? How did you get that front row seat, I want to know? In, in, terms of, in terms of really small venues and artists that are just starting out don't really have a name, for themselves yet, I really appreciate that uh, Seth allows put package deals together for groups of local bands on like Friday and Saturday nights. I think that's that's really outstanding that you allow the local bands to to really take a Friday or Saturday night at, at your venue. I know I can assure you it's out of pure desperation when I can't fill the yeah. night. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, it's nice that you think that. You know, but but I really, you know, I really appreciate that. Um, you know, I've seen some great shows there at, at 9:30, um, and but it's just starting out with like, you know, you know, I deal with a small 50 capacity thing, and trying just trying to get people into the shows and, and tracking things can be very tough sometimes. Uh, I I just wanted to bring up to people that there are, in terms of just getting. For sort of like startup groups and, and, and starter bands and stuff, uh, people in the D.C. area, I know that there are meetup groups existing in the D.C. area, in, indie music, uh, indie music meetup and uh, live, live music uh, D.C. meetup, and they're a very good uh, resource, and I'm sure there are parallel things in other areas that are good for just getting people's attention because there's so much screaming you can go to a movie on Friday night you can go out to a ball game whatever or you can stay home and watch TV that a lot of times if you're not dealing with a well-known band name or, or that has a brand already it it can be tough but you know when you establish this sort of cohort of people that establish that they enjoy going out to see live music I think that's a good start thanks Bob. thank you Anybody else with a question? Back there. Hi, I'm, I'm Christiana, and uh, by day I work at the Arts Council in Pittsburgh, and I just wanted to share something that we're embarking on. We uh, have a ticketing service, and we ticket for dance companies, theaters, and we're embarking on a shared community database that deals with ticket selling and sharing the information. And it's been something I've been thinking about, like how can musicians take part in that to, uh, you know, um, each company, it's, it's shared information. There is no competition or a feeling of competition. Like if someone goes to your dance company, they may also like your dance company. So is there a way to do that for musicians and music and venues and well, it sounds like Seth's already doing that, right? I mean, it's, you're kind of sharing information already with well, bands. I think what she's talking about other organizations. Yeah, I mean, we, we can share with the bands that are playing, but yeah, I think that's a great idea for bands to share info Absolutely. between themselves, and um, it'd be interesting to see how many of them get proprietary about it. Uh, Mike, let me ask you, when, when uh, you know, direct-to-fan ticketing, which, you know, clearly I think fits in with this discussion here, um, 
you know, when, when you're dealing with a band that's ticketing directly to fans like String Cheese did back in the day, uh, and more bands are doing that now, um, do they share that information? Is that something that they would share with other bands? Is that something that's, that's encouraged that other bands, do other bands ask for that information? And is it forthcoming usually from the, from the band that has it? it? It's a great question to be honest. I, I've never been asked by another band. Isn't that, that's kind of stunning, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> I'm not even sure on the way we collect data, and I, you almost have to be an expert on the can, on the can Spam Act in terms of how, how many layers deep you well, can right. share. Well, right, a lot of it could be perceived as spam, there's no doubt about it. Like, does a, you know, a fish fan want to hear from a string cheese yeah. fan mailing list? I don't know, you know. Yeah. It's, I mean, I suspect the answer to that is yes, they probably do. And I think that it's just that there's a certain amount of sort of intrinsic analness, anality about the whole business. <laughs> you know, it's my fan. I'm not going to give you my fan. And, and, and there's no way of exchanging that information. I wish we'd all grow up and be a bit more sensible. Uh, and I think that that's the problem, that we have a lot of fairly stupid people involved in the business. <laughs> True. <laughs> And if we were a bit more intelligent, we might solve a lot of these problems instead of sort of being all fighting in our little corners. I mean, I wish we were more open and more had discussions about. I mean, I've enjoyed this panel because of thinking about these issues. These are big issues. But, you know, if we all just dig in and say, that's shit, this is how to do it. I mean, you know, maybe we all need to sort of, even me, need to be a bit more humble. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a great issue because the money is on the table here. And I think... Uh these questions are going to be critical in the next five to ten years. We have time for like one or two more. There's a couple of hands over here. Do we Hi, have the um, I'd like okay. to, to um, respond to how um, the model of sharing really is working um, on the alt band, indie band level. Um, I do promoting and uh, marketing events work with groups out of LA, uh, some of which have gotten huge, like Maroon 5 um, and Phantom Planet. And the way that it's worked uh, has really been helped by the, um, what you're talking about, the integration of social media and uh, in the fan-to-fan, -fan, a street team level, and some of which have, like some of us have, are, have gone or have, are trying to go pro um, and working with bands as tour managers and, and so forth, um, and going out doing merch professionally and so forth. And the way that it has evolved is a very organic, natural way is the bands that wind up grouping together and touring together or started out in, for example, in L.A. at the Troube or wherever. A um, band like Rooney started out originally with uh, Maroon 5, and then a uh, band like Everybody Else or Big City Rock then went, got on the Rooney band um, uh, uh, bandwagon, so to speak. And uh, those fans and the bands themselves... Uh, work together, and um, those fan bases, the ticket buyers, if we're going to be looking at that from the financial perspective, um, naturally wind up sharing information. And originally it was just on the boards and so forth, or face-to-face, -face, or just making friends on email and email groups. But it's very, very dynamic at that smaller venue, you know, anywhere from 100, that 100 to uh, 1,000, 3,000, 5,000 seat level at getting the word out in advance, getting those tickets sold. And I think that it's kind of died out a bit um, the, um, with it sort of dying out of bulletin boards, but it's becoming re uh, revived again um, as a way of, of really doing things, selling out in pre-sale even. Is there a question? Um, I, that was just a comment, sorry. Okay. That it's really, just, it I, I want to get a couple working. of quick questions in here. So if you could frame your comment in a question, that would be much appreciated. We have time for one more. So hopefully it's a good one. I'll try, I'll try to make it a good one. Okay. My name is Steve Korn from BFM Digital. I'm really fascinated by the success of Facebook on that uh, Madison Square Garden sellout. I'm wondering if you gentlemen can comment on the use of some of the other type of digital services for promoting ticket sales like Turntable.fm, Spotify, uh, Mog, et cetera. Um, sure. Uh, well, um, you know, Facebook is far and away the biggest driver these days. Actually, interestingly enough, uh, in uh, relation to my business, Google and Facebook are our two biggest referrers. Um, but 
uh, services uh, that are driving a lot of ticket sales. In addition, um, one good example is Songkick. Um, we, Songkick drives an incredible number of ticket sales through our system. Um, so we're seeing the event listing services as a big driver. You know, they say that um, the lion's share of the time uh, why tickets go unbought is because people didn't know about the event. Um, so Songkick and uh, Bands in Town and Sonic Living, those are, those are great services. Um, I think over time we're going to see Spotify, Mog, RDO, all these guys drive ticket sales as well. Um, it's not material yet, uh, but I think that, that it's trending in that, in that direction. All right, very good. We've got to wrap it up. We appreciate you coming. I want to thank the panel for uh, a great discussion. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs> <laughs>